Right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I think I'm fairly safe in saying good afternoon, even across the time zones at this point in the day. Uh, I'm Christina Cortez. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Canning House. For those of you who do not know Canning House, and I hope that is a minority, uh, we are a not-for-profit organisation whose unique role uh, is to promote understanding and relationships between the UK and Latin America. And we've been doing it for nearly 80 years now. We are a forum for contacts, for thought leadership and for pragmatic debate on Latin American political, economic, social uh, and environmental trends and issues, and also business risks and opportunities. So we invest in research, we publish newsletters and reports, and we convene events uh, to raise awareness and understanding, uh, to aid policymaking, and also to encourage networking. We are independent and we are neutral, but we are not afraid of tackling controversies. We partner with ministers and government officials, with members of parliament and Congress, with embassies, other think tanks and universities from both sides of the Atlantic. And we also offer free individual membership to students. We publish the Canning House LATAM Outlook, which is a five year look ahead at political, economic, social, health and environmental and security developments in the region. And we also partner with the LSE's Latin America and Caribbean Center on the Canning House Research Forum, which is a five year research program whose first research fellow, Amir Lebdoui, uh, has undertaken the first two pieces of research. The first report was on inequality and trade diversification. And today's topic is Latin American trade in the age of climate change. But that's enough from me on Canning House. I'm looking forward very much to hearing the uh, talk about the report itself and also the discussants conversation afterwards. So I'm now going to, without further ado, hand over to Gareth Jones, the director of the LSE's LACC. Gareth, over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, so yes, my uh, good afternoon to you all. Um, my name is, is Gareth Jones. I'm director of the Latin America Caribbean Center here at the LSE. There are some familiar faces, so I, I realize I'm preaching to a choir in a certain sense. I'm also a professor of urban geography uh, in the Department of Geography and Environment, which uh, is particularly uh, appropriate for today's uh, panel uh, discussion. Um, I'm pleased to be uh, chairing or co-chairing uh, this event with Christine Cortez, CEO of, of Canning House, um, as well as having the opportunity to introduce the report by uh, Amir, uh, and to introduce and moderate discussion uh, with uh, the three uh, distinguished discussants, who, I say with some trepidation, uh, are virtually uh, behind me and uh, on the screen uh, in different parts of the world, I hope. Um, and they are uh, Minister Nicolas Grau of, of Chile, uh, Minister Andres Valenciano uh, of Costa Rica, uh, and Jeanette Sanchez uh, of ECLAC. I'll introduce them. Uh, more fully and more formally uh, in a second. Uh, just one or two quick points of, of housekeeping as to how uh, the uh, event will, will take place. Uh, it is hybrid, um, it is synchronous, and to some extent um, it is largely virtual uh, and will uh, result in a podcast. Uh, so it's being recorded um, with everybody's permission and subject to the usual uh, sort of technical caveats um, will be available uh, on the various platforms and, and media uh, in a very short time. Uh, the event also has a simultaneous translation in Spanish and Portuguese. And I think you, uh, for the Zoom people, uh, have to uh, activate some button or gizmo uh, or widget uh, somewhere uh, on that platform in order to get uh, the uh, interpretation. Uh, the LSE Latin America Center uh, tries to the best of our ability to uh, host events, uh, promote research, and undertake engagement in uh, at least three languages when we're able to do, and that's quite a challenge um, in the UK, uh, and it's even a challenge at the LSE. Uh, on, on occasion. Uh, so this event uh, is interpreted, but also Amir's uh, reports, which will be circulating uh, through the web pages and through social media, uh, is also available in English, Portuguese, and, and Spanish. Uh, at the end of the uh, presentation and the follow-up discussion, 
uh, by our three distinguished guests, um, there will be a chance for some Q&A, uh, and that can be conducted online. Uh, please enter into the Q&A function, uh, and Maria Clara will uh, curate those and ask them to the appropriate members of, uh, of the panel afterwards. For those of you in the room, uh, you can use your full digital dexterity uh, and put your hand up in old school, uh, old normal uh, fashion, and I will do my very best to call on you uh, if you have questions. And if you do not have questions, uh, but would still like to ask uh, uh, the speaker uh, something at the end of the event and or to network, uh, then we have coffee uh, and some refreshments outside. I'm assuming students won't have uh, identified those as a free public good uh, in the meantime, and that they will not disappear uh, in the 90 minutes or so that we are uh, in here. Um, let me then uh, introduce uh, our speaker and our three uh, discussants before handing the microphone on to, to Amir. Uh, Amir Ledoui is the Canny House Research Fellow uh, at the LSE LAC. Uh, his research lies at the crossroads between industrial policy, natural resource management, uh, and sustainable uh, development agenda. Uh, he holds a PhD in development studies from the University of Cambridge, uh, and he's also just been appointed to uh, a lectureship uh, at SOAS uh, in just a small postal district uh, shift uh, up the road. Uh, Nicolas Gural Veloso uh, is Minister of Economy, Development and Tourism uh, of Chile. Uh, he was Assistant Professor of Economics at the School of Economics and Business uh, at the University of Chile, and also a researcher at the Center for Social Conflict and Cohesion Studies, uh, COES, which I think is known to some of us here, uh, or also based in Chile. Uh, he obtained his PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania uh, in 2014, and his research has focused on the economics of crime and education. Uh, Andres Valenciano Yamuni uh, is the outgoing Minister of Foreign Trade for Costa Rica. He's over 15 years of professional experience. Uh, he's an industrial engineer who graduated from the University of Costa Rica uh, with a master's degree also in international business from the Fletcher School at Tufts University in the US, and he's the Lee Kuan Yew School Senior Fellow from the National University of Singapore. Uh, before becoming minister, uh, he was the executive president of the Instituto Nacional de Aprendizaje, uh, where he was in charge of technical and vocational education uh, in the country. Uh, and Jeanette uh, Sanchez uh, has been director of National Resource Division of ECLAC, uh, CEPAL, uh, in Santiago since 2017. She holds a PhD in public policy and social transformation uh, from the Autonomous University of Barcelona uh, and has also completed doctoral studies in development uh, at the Catholic University of Louvain, a master's in community and regional planning from the University of Texas and a master's in economics from Flexo uh, Ecuador, as well as uh, is an economist at the, at the Catholic University of Ecuador. We'll be hearing from each uh, of the three discussants in turn uh, later, but for now, I'm uh, very happy and delighted to pass the microphone or the standing position over to Amir uh, for a presentation about his report. I don't know where to look. It's uh, no. it's a very <laughs> new experience, but it's uh, an absolute pleasure to have the opportunity to present this report today. Uh, see some uh, friendly faces and some new faces too. And it's such a such a fancy room in the in the new building that uh, LSC has has built. But also, it's a great honor to be able to count on such an eminent group of of uh, discussions today uh, with a lot of experience precisely on those topics. So despite the fact that, you know, it would take a lot of time to cover a lot of things in the report, I'm very conscious of the fact that this presentation is the last thing standing in the way of the discussion with Andres, uh, Jeanette and, and Nicola. So I'll try to go straight to the point so we have more time for, for discussion. So the objective of this report was to analyze the impact of climate change and its mitigation on Latin American trade, but also explore some of the opportunities and policy pathways 
that uh, arise from the sustainability agenda. More particularly, the report has five main messages that should pop up anytime soon. This one. The first one, yeah. The first one is uh, the fact that climate change and its mitigation will have very serious uh, effects on uh, trade in both in the short term and in the long term on Latin American trade. And those effects are heightened by the region's uh, existing trade profile. The second message is that renewable energy deployment has been quite a success in Latin America to date. However, more needs to be done to link renewable energy expansion with uh, the industrial development agenda. The third message is that biodiversity and environmental assets in general are one of the region's most valuable assets. Uh, and there has been pioneering efforts uh, so far in terms of the conservation of such assets, but more needs to be done to uh, leverage biodiversity as, a, as an engine of, of, of sustainable economic development, uh, not only through carbon trade, ecotourism, but also uh, through a high value added biodiversity based innovation. The fourth message is that policy forces, uh, sorry, policy tools uh, and coordinated policy tools in particular will be absolutely crucial in uh, achieving such vision for low carbon, for developmental low carbon transition. And lastly, given the multifaceted nature of the policy tools that are needed and the need for regional coordination, uh, a Latin American Green Deal could be the way forward. Uh, there are challenges uh, to, to, to such an agenda, but they're not insurmountable. So the first part of the pre presentation is on the impact of climate change on trade and development in Latin America. The first thing to say is that the, there's already been an effect due to the increasing frequency of extreme meteorological events, uh, notably on ag agricultural production and therefore by extension food security, but also on tourism. Just to note a few examples, and there are more in the report, but in 2020, which is the year that has started this report, droughts had caused a loss of almost 80% of maize ground in Guatemala's highland region and about half of cultivated crops in the Cerritos municipality in Mexico. And at the same time, hurricanes were also causing great damage uh, on agricultural production in countries like Honduras, um, estimated at about $2 billion of losses, which for relatively small economies like Honduras, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, same in terms of tourism, which is one of the important sources of foreign exchange revenues in the region. Um, for some countries like the Dominican Republic, it represents over 40% of export er earnings. Climate change and Meteorological events can cause a loss, uh, a considerable loss of visitors. Uh, and in 2017, the hurricane season basically caused about 11,000 jobs. So these are the different ways in which kind of sporadic effect, sorry, uh, sporadic events have an effect on climate change, but they're also long term gradual uh, effects. Fluctuations in precipitation and temperature threaten the long term productivity of several agricultural outputs that the country, uh, sorry, that the region depends on as a source of revenues. Uh, so I remember a few years back when discussing with basically heads of business association, industry associations, and so on, I often heard this notion that, oh, but you know, we are exporting so many diverse uh, things like fruits and salmon and shrimps and banana, and these are, can be high value added. So why would we care about economic diversification? But if you think about the effect of climate change, and there is a key reason, to care and to think about a sustainable uh, productive diversification. So a one degree increase or, or fluctuations, irregular fluctuations in temperature can have, for instance, dramatic effects on productivity for salmon farming in Chile, coffee production in Colombia or cocoa production in Ecuador. And these are just a few examples. Now, I may sound like I'm just a bear of bad news. I promise that the presentation gets a bit more optimistic later on, but not yet. Um, fossil fuel producers, so the climate change 
not only climate change, but also its mitigation also have considerable effects on long-term trade prospects. For example, fossil fuel producers face uh, gloomy prospects in the context of the global energy transitions, which matters particularly for countries that depend on fossil fuels as a source of uh, public revenues and, and jobs. So countries like Bolivia, Col Colombia, Ecuador, and Venezuela. And in those countries, the global energy transition will not only cause a loss of export and public revenues, but also a considerable loss of jobs. Right? It's estimated that about nearly 400,000 jobs will be lost in fossil fuel extraction and electric ba electricity based generation. And most of these jobs will actually disappear by 2030, which is fairly soon. However, there are also some brighter news, uh, which has to do with the increasing demand in minerals that are key inputs for low carbon technologies. So things like uh, lithium, copper, nickel, manganese, cobalt. Um, on what you see on the figures on the right is that, I mean, the kind of these technologies are, are crucial to things like battery performance. Um, an electric car, for example, contains two times more copper than a car with a combustion engine. So the demand is likely to increase uh, for different of those minerals in the next decades. And Latin America is well endowed in a variety of these minerals, which is why they might play a key role in the region's trade future. You can find all this information in the report. I'm not gonna go through kind of each of those minerals and how much contains it, but the gist of it is that it's, it's a lot of it, right? That is currently uh, held in Latin America. However, the, the optimism was, is, is short-lived because it's very important to note that there are prevailing risks of technological uncertainty and disruption. It's not like this is just you know, the new oil, so the energy transition will just be very sweet to Latin America and there's not much to worry about. A hundred years ago, for example, Chile was highly dependent on nitrate exports. I think the Chileans in the room and, and in the Zoom uh, room will be well aware of this. But essentially in the 1930s, this German scientist named Fritz Haber figured out how to synthesize nitrate. And from you know, a month to the next, virtually Chile's exports were worth uh, virtually nothing, uh, which led to an economic crisis uh, in the country. And the, me, the key message here is that there have been many Fritz Habers since, there'll be many more Fritz Habers. This happens constantly. And it has relevance today when we discuss the, 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 the issue of critical minerals, because there's a lot of resources being put into R&D to develop batteries, for example, that don't use lithium, but use phosphate or that don't use cobalt. Uh, for example, hydrogen-based batteries or solid state batteries, which means that for policymakers in the region, it's very important not to put your eggs in the same basket or not to put too much hope on critical minerals being what drives the region uh, through uh, uh, the global energy transition. So talking about kind of different ways forward, um, I wanted to talk about, you kind of give a landscape of renewable energy deployment in the region and the related value chains. Renewable energy deployment has been quite a success in Latin America. Uh, renewables in primary energy generation and renewable energy capacity per capita are actually twice the world average. Uh, and in Mexico, Peru, and Chile, utility companies are already procuring solar and wind energy that, uh, sorry, sorry, solar and wind based electricity that has the lowest cost globally from power, for power generation from any, um, any source, about six times uh, cheaper than actually produced electricity produced from fossil fuels. However, disparities still exist at the sub-regional and national level. For example, in the Caribbean, renew renew renewable energy capacity is quite low, uh, and the energy access gap is still high in some countries like Nicaragua, Guatemala, and Peru, uh, which affects low-income groups, but also businesses, uh, as it's been shown that they suffer from nearly three electrical shortages, outages per month, uh, which leads to productivity losses. Broadly speaking, you can categorize countries in the region in four main groups. Those are that heavily rely on fossil fuels as a source of uh, electricity consumption. And those face the greatest, greatest urgency in transitioning to clean energy sources, uh, given that they might, run, they might run out of fossil fuels uh, fairly soon. Uh, those that heavily rely on hydropower, which also face the need to diversify their energy mix, given the high vulnerability of hydropower to climatic conditions. So when you have a drought, it actually affects your ability to produce hydropower. And the countries that have a diverse mix between fossil fuels and renewables or a diverse mix of renewables. And those countries 
a more resilient energy matrix, but some of them still face the challenge of expanding renewable energy capacity, uh, especially when energy needs are not yet fully met. In terms of investments, I'll just mention a couple of points, not to go through everything, but although it's been, it's been increasing very fast, actually at faster pace than the world average, uh, three countries, Brazil, Chile, and Mexico, have concentrated about three quarters of investments in the region since 2010. And, uh, and the technology composition has also changed a lot. So in, about 15 years ago, uh, biofuels accounted for most of investments in renewable energy in Latin America, but nowadays, solar and wind energy account for 99%. In terms of trade, although considerable benefits exist from cross-border trade in electricity, uh, it's estimated about $2 billion uh, annually of, 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 of savings with unconstrained regional trade. Most of those gains would be in the Andean region. Those trade operations have remained limited. Um, and the benefits of regional trade are even higher considering that, uh, you know, when variable energy sources work together in systemic basis, similarly to the European, uh, to the North Pool model in, in, in Europe, where, for example, if there is a week or a day with less solar radiation or when the wind blows uh, less hard, then, you know, kind of nuclear energy picks up. Nuclear is a whole different kind of uh, topic, so we're not going to go into that. But the idea is to be able to have kind of systemic approach uh, at the regional level, uh, which is why the integration of Latin American countries in a regional electricity grid constitutes a key policy priority moving forward. Um, I'll skip the deployment part just for, for uh, if you want to talk about it during the Q&A, we can discuss it. But the few points I wanted to still make is on manufacturing and value chains. So Latin American countries, with the notable exception of Brazil, are mostly inserted in low value added segments of renewable energy value chains. Right? So most of the uh, countries in the region mostly export raw materials like lithium, balsa wood, uh, iron ore and plastics uh, that are mostly to China um, to produce renewable energy technologies and import wind turbine solar panels and so on. So there is wind turbine manufacturing capacity in Brazil and Mexico and Argentina to a lesser extent, uh, but most uh, wind turbines in the region have been imported. Um, some international companies like Vestas and others have been investing in, in, in expanding manufacturing capacity, but discussion with a few of them reveals that uh, there are many hurdles that prevent from expanding manufacturing capacity in the region, including the volatility of demand, right, which also is related to the lack of market integration. In each country, it's very hard to plan expansions because demand varies a lot from year to year, which is also related to unstable energy politics. Uh, most of it, I mean, has been, this has been particularly reflected in Mexico in recent years, where the kind of approach towards renewables have, has dramatically changed. Similarly, in terms of high value added segments of renewables value chain, in terms of innovation, there is a mixed record. Uh, Brazil is probably the country that has uh, done the most in terms of spearheading uh, R&D activities in the region, including particularly biofuels, right, which is pretty much a Brazilian success story. But on a less positive note, R&D capacity in renewables remain quite low in Latin America, well below the global levels. Um, and most of R&D in the region is actually, there's something to say about public and private funding. Here I put an X because they're not necessarily opposed to one another, it's not versus, uh, or it's not even the sum of it, but it can be a multiplier. Um, and in the, in the region, most countries have, in most countries, public financing is over 50%, sometimes even over 70%, of R&D, but if you look at the share in uh, advanced economies, public financing for R&D is lower than 35%. So moving forward, uh, finding ways to encourage complementary private investment for R&D will, uh, will be essential. Now, the last point I want to make on renewables has to do is about hydrogen and opportunities for value addition, notably through low carbon services. Latin America has a unique opportunity to produce hydrogen, green hydrogen competitively. Chile was the first country to unveil a hydrogen development strategy, which sets an ambition to export $11 billion uh, by 2035, which is very soon. Good luck, uh, Nicola. But, um, but it's been followed by Brazil, Colombia, and Panama. There's a diverse set of opportunities for the different countries of the region. Some of them see hydrogen as a way to boost exports. Some of them to reduce the fossil, the, the 
diesel uh, import bill, uh, but all, also others to, as they see it as a way to decarbonize mining, right? Especially given the pressure for reducing the carbon intensity of mining activities. However, the discussion also needs to go further than hydrogen, right? The objective doesn't just need to be about exporting green hydrogen, but about thinking about all the market opportunities that exist for localizing and decarbonizing energy intensive services. Uh, so Latin American countries could leverage the renewable energy potential and green, green hydrogen potential to be early movers towards the provision of a range of decarbonized goods and services in terms of low carbon manufacturing like green steel, uh, low carbon mining, but also technology services like data clouding services, cryptocurrency farming. That's something that is also quite uh, the source of heated debates, but again, that's up for, for discussion. And those industries face challenges due to their carbon intensity. So expanding, looking forward, expanding the provision of reliable, cheap, and clean energy could be used as an asset in the region to attract uh, FDI in those activities and ensure that existing clean energy is not redirecting from other activities that would have to revert back to dirtier sources of energy. Now, the second, actually now, third point is about biodiversity in the context of trade strategies. Latin, America, Latin American countries and communities provide a range of ecosystemic services from which the whole world benefits, but essentially no one pays for it, right? Uh, there has been policy efforts, especially in Costa Rica, to, mar to marketize and compensate for the, for the protection of environmental assets. The most famous, or at least the flagship uh, initiative is Costa Rica's payment for ecosystem, ecosystem services, whereby landowners receive direct compensation uh, for the services that their land produce when they adopt environmental friendly uh, land uses. I think they received an award from Prince William, was it, uh, for, this, for this initiative? And it's been replicated in some other countries, like in Colombia, especially in the context of post-conflict local development, where areas, biodiverse areas, have been remained untouched. And now the question is about how to sustain local livelihoods while you know, avoiding uh, extractive uh, activities. However, such mechanisms are often limited to national boundaries, and local communities often struggle to receive remuneration from the international community, which also benefits from these services. So in that context, carbon markets, essentially putting a price on pollution, could be an interesting way to generate trade value from biodiversity protection. In 2019, 2019 governments globally raised about $45 million that way. And in the region, Mexico, Chile, and, Chile, and Colombia have begun to use or considering using carbon emissions trading systems. However, to, add, to act as effective trade tools, those will need to cut, cut across country and continental boundaries. So if there was a kind of regional uh, carbon emissions trading system, it would make it easier for the region to negotiate as a block or at least to trade carbon permits with the EU or, or other countries and generate more value from outside the region. Ecotourism also needs to be mentioned as this is probably one of the ways that's been the most discussed uh, in terms of how to generate trade value and for an exchange through biodiversity protection. Um, and it has some benefits. Uh, it's a very good tool to promote social inclusion, poverty allevi alleviation, especially in remote areas where alternative sources of job creation are scarce. So people who engage in ecotourism, usually you don't go to the main urban centers, you go out of the way, well, which enables the resources or the revenues to be diffused. But there are very important limitations that need to be mentioned, one of which is revenue volatility and climate vulnerability that I mentioned earlier. Um, the Galapagos Islands actually kind of are a case in point of those limitations. Uh, and during the the COVID-19 pandemic, they lost about 75% of revenues. Uh, and I remember at the time um, meeting, I don't know if it's lucky or unlucky, but meeting the governor of the Galapagos that was complaining that because of that loss of revenues, they had much less resources to put into biodiversity conservation. So it was pressing to find alternative ways to generate trade value. Innovation was one of them as the next slide will show. Um, but there's also an issue of environmental damage, right? Too much ecotourism kills ecotourism. Um, so alternative, finding alternative ways to capture the economic value of biodiversity uh, is quite important, which leads us to this hummingbird. Um, do you have any engineers in the room besides uh, Andres? Yeah. <laughs> Basically, what do you see in terms of the innovation value of this bird? What strikes you? 
besides the fact that it's very pretty. Any guesses? Speed of its tapping. Oh, interesting. I thought you were going to say the speed of its. Of its uh, so it could have been, but not this one. But this hummingbird actually is the source of inspiration for the Japanese bullet trains, right? Because of the aerodynamic shape of its beak. Uh, and this is just, I wish we had three hours just to talk about, you know, that aspect of biodiversity based innovation, but unfortunately we don't, and probably better for you. Uh, but the examples are endless, right? In terms of innovations that have shaped human engineering. Uh, that has been inspired from nature, uh, mostly from Latin America. And biodiversity is indeed a source of information, right, that can feed into industrial and innovation processes. And the, the potential in Latin America is huge. Uh, and there has been some efforts to, to, to develop it, but with both successes and failures. So in Costa Rica, which I had the chance to visit last November, um, since the 90s, there has been efforts towards what they call bioprospecting, which is the mapping of genetic material across the country as a bank of, of knowledge. And there's been early recognition of biodiversity as a, as, a, as a bank of knowledge that could be used for different purposes and for innovation. Um, and just to, there's a lot, a lot of examples to, to mention, but just to give you an idea of what we're essentially talking about, the person here on the bottom right, whose name is Yendri, is a researcher in, in, in Costa Rica, in Lanatec, and her and her team had discovered this worm when, that when provoked um, produces this hydrogel, which is essentially as strong as superglue, right? And I had, I've seen it with my own eyes and it's incredible. And this thing can be used, you know, the commercial applications are endless. It could be used for, instead of stitches, it can be used and it has no toxins. But her, like many other researchers in that position, you know, usually the way works that you publish uh, an article in a prestigious review uh, and then the kind of commercial benefits from those at best maybe a patent but the commercial benefits from those are usually reaped in other regions of the world right which poses a, a, a question of compensation and and local value added um, so the talking to different researchers in those ecosystems in, in different countries the it appears that there are several hurdles, right, to, to reap the full potential of biodiversity-based innovation. One of them is the limited bioprospecting to date, right? So Costa Rica has done quite a lot of it and still has not finished, but in other countries, we don't yet have you know, the full information of what is out there, right, that can be used for, for innovation. A lack of critical mass of specialized human capital, right? due to a limited interdisciplinary university training related to bioinnovation. Most of the researchers involved in that space are actually anomalies in a way, right? These are people who studied biology and then somehow ended up studying nanotechnology in Switzerland and then came back. But this kind of particular training uh, is not provided in the traditional curriculum. Uh, inadequate financial support and administrative hurdles when it comes to handling uh, biomaterials. Now, in terms of the policy implications, uh, I'll discuss some at the national level, some at the regional level, and then the implication for a Latin American Green Deal. The first one is about the role of green industrial policies in encouraging the structural transformation uh, towards the trade opportunities that arise from the global decarbonization agenda. Uh, a long-term vision will be needed to coordinate efforts, all right, in developing what is the so-called industries without smokestacks. And the strategic areas where industrial policies could focus on include critical mineral supply chains, but also green hydrogen trade, low carbon mining methods, high value added carbon services, and biodiversity based innovation. And over the past two years, more specifically, several governments in the region have, have taken important steps in the direction. So Costa Rica had published a bioeconomy strategy, Argentina, a national green skills program, and Uruguay, a green economy plan. The other thing to mention is green skills. Right, which are needed to, to basically to localize green jobs in Latin America. Um, the transitions to a low carbon economy require human capital, right? Because at the end of the day, this is about people being able to do and provide services and, 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 uh, and goods uh, and their competencies doing so. Um, and here, their development is not just about you know, adding a course here and there and related to renewables and, and green stuff and that's it. But it really calls for a rethinking of 
national education programs into ensuring that people have the skills that will enable them to, re to reap trade opportunities that arise from energy transitions. Um, in Argentina, the, at the provincial, provincial level in Santa Fe, a public agency was created recently to develop green skills uh, for workers to be able to kind of transition towards you know, sunset industries to new industries. And these kind of programs have high policy relevance, including in countries like Chile, where there is a phase out coal plan, right? But there's no guarantee that the regions where jobs will be lost because of the, because coal mine will close, will be the same regions where renewable energy jobs will be created. And this context, these are the contexts in which green skills programs and uh, along with labor market policies can help ensure that no one is left behind, not only coal miners, but also marginalized communities um, along gender line as well, making sure that no one is, is left behind. The financing landscape is quite important. Um, this kind of vision will require not only an increase in efficient public spending, but also ways to attract private capital, uh, notably to support low carbon technology startups. Long-term R&D funding uh, is key to stimulate these kind of transitions, especially when profits from innovation uh, can only be expected far into the future. Uh, unfortunately, the domestic private banking sector tends to be risk averse and often fails to provide the conditions enabling long-term seed funding for innovation. This is why many of the, of the university spin-offs that had, uh, came into contact, they had to look for venture capitalists outside the country. Uh, venture capitalists play a key role in that aspect in terms of helping uh, startups move uh, from the discovery to the commercialization phase. But even in the context of venture capital, investors tend to be attracted to opportunities where an exit can be achieved within a reasonably short uh, time period. So in those contexts, and historically, for successful energy transition, states have played the key role in long-term financing and, 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 uh, and particularly the role of national development banks need to be mentioned. They can help overcome some of those limitations by reducing the level of risks for uh, not to be through blended finance, but also by realigning financial flows uh, through both direct financing and mobilizing private finance to, to finance the investment required for local transitions. The last point on, on the circular economy, is, uh, on sorry, on national policies is uh, the circular economy, which is essentially a careful management of material flows um, uh, by reducing and reinserting waste into production processes. And this has high implications for the topic of today um, because linear production systems exacerbate environmental damage, right? And lead, lead to the dumping of waste, which is already happening with, with, with Chile, with the, the dumping of used apparel from the EU to, to the country. But in contrast, circular production systems present an opportunity to, to use and trade these materials uh, as a valuable input for production processes. So for example, in Uruguay, uh, with the support of uh, UNIDO, Uruguay is actually the country with the highest cattle per capita, it's about three cows per, per humans. So they produce a lot of dairy and they've used um, essentially the waste right, from, from, from cows uh, to produce bio biogas. And in some farms, biogas now represents over 40% of revenues. So this is a way to add value while uh, integrating a circular economy approach in, 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 in production. And Latin American countries are, are increasingly adopting similar agendas um, and publishing national circular economy strategies. However, there is a clear limit on what individual governments can do without regional cooperation. Um, and the two things in particular are regional supply chains and cross-border biodiversity protection. Environmental assets in the region cut across borders, like the Amazon or, or, the, or the oceans. Uh, so ensuring effective uh, biodiversity protection and avoiding over-exploitation of, of goods require collaboration. So the recent Eastern Tropical Pacific Marine Corridor between Colombia, Panama, Costa Rica, and Ecuador represents these kind of initiatives that need to be expanded. And same with regional supply chains, where a common vision and roadmap is needed to boost productivity gains and economies of scale, um, ensure resilience to, to, to external shocks. So if you know, there is a lockdown in China, then it's not gonna impact the whole value chain in terms of expanding renewables in, in, in Ecuador and so on. Regional information sharing to match supply and demand is also particularly important. So a more systematic, systematic sharing of procurement needs 
uh, but also support to complete geological surveys across the region. So what I presented earlier in terms of critical minerals, this is just what we know based on the information that's been gathered to date. And uh, last one, capacity building, right? Uh, which national capacity building actually hinges on regional collaboration. This is not just the regional certification schemes for low carbon goods, but also given the low levels of R&D re across the region, almost across the board, it makes sense to pool R&D resources to co-develop solutions for the region, especially given some of the common challenges that they face, like high altitude mining. Regional alliances can also be built uh, to that involve public, private, uh, academ academic actors to identify common challenges and opportunity assessments for specific technologies like wind turbines, similarly to what is being done, for example, in Europe with the European Battery Alliance. And uh, lastly, regionalization of carbon emissions trading systems, which would boost conservation efforts and compensate local communities. And that need for regional approach is precisely why it makes sense to discuss the idea of a Latin American Green Deal, right? Which is essentially a package that aims to bring together, you know, kind of climate goals, economic development goals, and social inclusion, which has been discussed in many geographies, uh, but increasingly also in developing uh, regions, including in Latin America under different names. Some people talk about uh, Pacto Verde, Pacto Ecosocial, but the idea is to come together around uh, kind of a green economy plan. <laughs> This idea is relevant because of the need for regional coordination for a climate smart uh, development model in the region, uh, and specifically the synergies and complementarities that exist uh, across the different countries of the region. So from critical mineral abundance in Chile and Peru to manufacturing capacity in Brazil and Costa Rica to renewable energy potential in Mexico and Paraguay to the proximity to important trade routes as in Panama. And so coming together for the development of an efficient regional industrial ecosystem around low carbon technology um, makes sense. They, the idea of a Latin American Green Deal holds potential to generate economic benefits uh, across a range of sectors, right? Not only manufacturing, climate smart mining, but also agriculture, right? With climate resilient agriculture, uh, and clean energy. There's a few examples of policies there, but again, we can discuss more if, if it's of interest. And lastly, you know, not to sound too naive, but it's true that there are important challenges, right, to, especially in the financing side and political divisions, but these challenges are not unavoidable. Uh, access to financing, I mean, this such a program would involve considerably high costs, but they need to be measured against the losses that are caused by climate change. Right, which is estimated by the ADB to reach about $100 billion per year by 2050. Uh, but also the rising returns from regional coordination and investment in low carbon technologies. Yeah. Um, yeah, in terms of political uh, misalignments, this is a much larger challenge uh, due to ideological divergence, personal rivalries, different positioning in terms of US-China uh, competition, which have hindered market integration. But cooperation still persists in different formats, uh, even if more efforts will be necessary. The latest success has been the Escaso Agreement. So we need to capitalize on those existing cooperation mechanisms and bring together different actors to identify credible regional, sub-regional targets and overcome coordination issues. And just to finish, I wanted to, to mention this quote from Albert Hirschman, this famous development economist who spent a lot of time in Latin America because there is a whole element of creative imagination here. Uh, the status quo won't help Latin American economies leap forward um, economically and developmentally. So there's a need to reimagine the kind of future possibilities in terms of, of green trade. So what he said is that creativity always comes as a surprise to us. Therefore, we can never count on it and we dare not believe in it until it has happened. In other words, we would not consciously engage upon tasks whose success clearly requires that creativity be forthcoming. Hence, the only way in which we can bring our creative resources fully into play is by misjudging the nature of the task, by presenting it to, be a, to ourselves to be a more routine, simple, and demanding of genuine creativity that it will turn out to be. And this is the same type of logic that explains why in regions like, the, like Europe, they're able to come together discussing uh, a green deal, whereas 50 years ago, we'd have probably been unthinkable, right, to imagine such cooperation uh, in, in this region. So thank you very much for your attention. I think the report can be already downloaded from um, the LSC and Canadian House web pages. 
thank to all those who contributed to the report. As the author, I get to get my face on, on the report, but it took a whole village to, to raise this, uh, this child, essentially, uh, both the team at LSE and, uh, and, and at Canning House, also the people in Latin America who have kindly shared their, their expertise. And uh, yeah, to learn more about the Canning House Farm, here's the page. And if you need to contact me for any follow-up questions, discussions, don't hesitate to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. And uh, yeah, why didn't you take a well-earned rest for a moment or two? Uh, and we will uh, run through some comments, I think, in the order in which I uh, introduced the uh, discussants. Uh, starting off with Nicolas, if the audio uh, works, and then we'll move straight to Andres and then uh, Jeanette, uh, if that's possible. So Nicolas, uh, a warm welcome and some feedback and commentary from your perspective. Okay. Okay, so uh, first, uh, thanks for uh, giving me the chance to, to talk about this uh, report. This report is quite uh, relevant and uh, it's a very good timing for the kind of debates that we are uh, currently having in, in Chile so it's, it was useful to to my work actually so thanks uh, thanks for that uh, and thanks for Amir Amir is a, a good friend and Juan Pedro Campo who sent me the, the invitation initially okay. so um, I'm gonna say two two things one is a more um, conceptual issue that was um, uh, Came to my mind uh, during the the reading of the of the of the report and also during the the presentation of Amir and the other one and and, and then I'm going to say some some uh, things that are relevant for the Chilean uh, debates. But this is going to be some the, the second part is going to be just enumerating some uh, uh, relevant uh, uh, things that are are in the report that are relevant for the for the debate in Chile. So about the, the conceptual debate, I think. I mean, there is one relevant uh, debate in, in, in economics about how to measure development, okay? And, uh, and, uh, and if you see the, the, the trend in the last, let's say, uh, 30 years, the answer to that question is uh, well-being or some measure of, of well-being, okay? But then if you see the, 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 the previous tradition, let's say in, in the, during the 50s, the 40s and, and so on, the idea was to measure well-being by manufacture or or the or your product productive capabilities that you have in the in the country. Okay. And uh, and and I was thinking that uh, when the uh, uncertainty that you have um, the certainty that you have uh, is so high as the one that we have given the, the climate uh, change, um, the 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 idea of just focusing on well-being. Or, or let me put it in a, in a statistical way, the idea of focusing just on the average or the expected well-being and not in the variance of the well-being is not complete. Okay? So I think, I think there, is a, there is a way to put these two traditions together and, uh, and uh, in the sense that it's not, what matters is not just the expectation of well-being that you have for the next 10 years in, for a country, but also what are the uh, variants of that well-being. And for the variants, it's quite relevant uh, diversification, complexity, uh, productive uh, capabilities, and, and so on. So if, as Amir said, the, uh, the, uh, the level of uncertainty that we face given the climate uh, change is much more relevant than, than the one that we had, for example, in the case, in the case of, uh, you, were say, you were talking about the, 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 this historical event in Chile about the, the salitre, nitrogen is the way to say salitre in, uh, in English, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, the, 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 the risk that we face as a country at that point in the, in the 30s in Chile, because we were uh, focusing all our exportation on, on, on salitre, uh, uh, now is much more bigger in the in the context of uh, climate change. So that that is my first uh, my first comment. I think there is a there is an opportunity, given the the, the climate change and given this uh, debate, to rediscuss how to define uh, uh, well being and putting together these two traditions. Okay. Sorry, not well being, but uh, 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 how to measure uh, development. This is one uh, one comment. Uh, then uh, let me say why this um, uh, report is relevant for Chile. First, 
I agree with the report that Latin America has a, a has a important opportunity uh, if we are able to 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 put to 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 make progress in this idea of uh, of, a, uh, of a green deal in, in in Latin America. I think that you can imagine two types of, of countries, the the uh, uh, and and the, and the relevant uh, aspect to 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 classify uh, countries is what are your sources of energy and what are your main products that you that you export i think if you if you think about that uh, uh, chile uh, is going to be in the in the in the group of countries uh, for which uh, climate change is is a, is a is an opportunity because we produce copper lithium and in the future we're going to produce uh, green hydrogen so uh, for sure these two products these three products are quite relevant for electrification and in general for uh, having uh, having uh, green uh, energy so basically we are in the we are in the right path in the case of chile and uh, but we have but but this is just an opportunity this is not a it's not something that's given and and and, and i think that there are many um, uh, tips in the uh, in the report in order to uh, to to take a full advantage of this opportunity that that Chile that Chile has, uh, so let me let me say what are my uh, my, my takes up for uh, uh, from the from the report in terms of what are the challenges that we have to to take a full um, advantage of this uh, opportunity. First, there there is an issue here about how to how to scale up and uh, all this investment. Okay? We need to we need investment toward a green economy as fast as, as we can and uh, and also we need we need to to discuss about the orientation of this uh, approach it's not it's not really relevant how you make this investment how you how you make the linkages with with uh, with local uh, producers uh, how you um, how you manage the uh, potential tension between big firms and small and medium firms i mean if, if you talk to big firms in chile to me it's pretty clear that they are prepared for this transition this transition actually they are leading this 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 uh, transition even without the coordination of the of the government okay they they have let's say they have same some advantage in this uh, in this uh, in this this process but the problem is what we're going to do with the small and medium firms so there is a there is a there is an there is a uh, chance that uh, this uh, transition toward an, uh, a, green, a green economy uh, increases the uh, inequality that we have in Chile or increases the uh, heterogeneity that we have in, in, in productivity in, in Chile. And this is a big problem because that is going to impact on, on wages, that is going to be relevant for the socio-ecological transition from what we, what we are now to what we want to, want to, uh, want to be in the, in the future. Okay. So, uh, so uh, the, the, in the report, it's pretty clear this idea that uh, we, we cannot take for granted the, the fact that uh, the employment that is destroyed is going to be uh, uh, is going to be created in the same amount and in the same locations. Okay? So this is quite relevant for for Chile because it's true we have copper, we have lithium, we have this uh, potential industry of uh, green hydrogen. But uh, the the the, oppor the business opportunities that are created are not necessarily in the same places that the oppor opportunities that are being uh, closed. Okay? So this is a huge challenge, uh, politically speaking, for the for the for the government. Okay? Um, the 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 fact that we need we need much more knowledge about how to how to involve the communities in this process, uh, which is a because you can say to the, and I'm going to finish with this, you can say to the communities in, let's say, in the in Magallanes, in the south of Chile, that the uh, green hydrogen is so relevant for the world. Okay? But, but, they, but, but, but maybe this is not going to have an impact there. This is not going to create employments there. And it's going to create some uh, uh, ecological problems there also. Okay? So there is a tension between what is the goal, uh, uh, the, 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 the goal for uh, globally speaking, and what is the goal uh, in, for that community in, in particular? Okay? This is, I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic because, uh, as I said at the beginning, Chile is a country that has all the uh, uh, opportunities to, to take advantage uh, from this situation, but 
uh, it's, not, it's not for granted and it requires, and I'm gonna finish with this, a lot of uh, coordination uh, within, within the, the, the government. And what is true is that the way that the government or the state is uh, structured in Chile, and I imagine in, in many other countries, it's not that easy to create that coordination. It's not that, that easy to get the, the coordination that you need in order to, to move forward. Okay, so let me finish in saying that it is a, a, a quite relevant report for, for the current debate that, uh, that we have in Chile. And, uh, and, uh, and, and let me also give some message to the uh, scholars that are, that are there and the students that are there. Chile uh, is, uh, has this opportunity, but we are pretty open to have more debates about this. If you want to make your research uh, in, this, uh, in this transition that we are gonna have in Chile, you are more than welcome to, to do so. We can talk about that because we need more we need more ideas and we need more people thinking about how to make this uh, transition. So we're pretty open to, to have a better, a, a good connection, a good link between the academia and the, and the uh, public policy. Thanks. Okay. Perfect. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the, for the invitation for the, to the, all the organizers, Canning House, LSE, uh, for, for the invitation to this event. I'm really, really happy to be here. Uh, congratulations to Amir, to Gunning House, to LSE, and all the people involved in the report. Um, as, as you can see by now, the, the report is very ambitious. And I, I want to start by, by, by a comment in terms of the system-wide approach that the report has. I think this is very, very, very important because many times, especially in academia, um, because of over-specialization, we try to approach this type of social challenges from one or the other area of expertise. But at the end of the day, uh, the real challenges are this complex, which forces us to see the big picture and the need to work with others. So I hope the people at the audience, the students particularly understand the level of effort that in this case, uh, Dr. Amir has gone and his team to try to present the big, big picture. Um, because at the end of the day, these are the type of challenges that policymakers face. Uh, they are, there are a lot of trade-offs and dealing with something like climate change and its impact and, and the type of structural transformations that we have on the report or the, the report is trying to, 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 to discuss, I think it paints the right picture in terms of the messiness of development, more along the lines of what also Nicolas was mentioning. So on that end, I think it's also really important uh, that the report has a lot of examples of what countries are doing, because I think it, 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 it showcases how some countries have certain pieces of the puzzle, but at the end of the day, development is a lot of things that need to happen at the same time, right? And that requires a lot of um, uh, systems-wide thinking, and I think that the report does a really good job at that. Second point in, in general terms about the report is that <clears throat> I'm not gonna comment in terms of the challenges uh, of, of climate change because the premise, and I'm assuming that everyone recognizes the level of risk that this represents. But I think the important thing underlying on the report, and frankly, I would have loved to see a little bit more of that, is how a green transition is a social transition at the end of the day. So when we're talking about the requirement of skills and industrial policies and R&D investment, that the report very, very, very well uh, recognizes. For example, I would have loved to see a gender lens to all of this, because as, uh, as Nicolas rightly pointed out, there's a lot of um, variance or variability in terms of who are the most affected, but the structural barriers that are right now affecting, for example, many women or youth accessing the labor market are only going to be highlighted by these type of transformations. And having applying a, a gender lens, for example, to, to the analysis will reveal the need for proactive policies in that direction. So that's one thing. Uh, having this discussion, not only from a sustainability, but understanding that at the end, this is a social issue, I think um, is key for, for doing that. Um, that now I, I would like to share just very briefly, uh, because I know we have limited time, what in Costa Rica are we doing? What have been the challenges? And then talk about, I'll final, I finalize talking about what I see are the structural challenges in Latin America to try to move this agenda forward. So for Costa Rica, um, as some of you may know, um, 
we, we have made a deliberate effort for the last 20 years to try to make sure that an export diversification strategy, an FDI strategy actually, has to be integrated to biodiversity and sustainability plans. And this was very well thought out when Costa Rica launched a decarbonization plan. And here are a couple of things that I think can be useful when we're talking about a Green New Deal moving forward, which is a decarbonization plan or a net zero agenda or a Green New Deal has to be able to send very clear messages to every actor, every social, political, economic actor, including investors in the private sector on how they can take advantage of such plans. For example, highlighting business opportunities or how they can better prepare for um, future regulations that this will change or need to be changed on local or international markets. As Amir pointed out, the Green New Deal in Europe is already sending very strong signals to exporters from our region on how regulations will change in the future. Second area of, of I think, of, of lessons to be learned and discussed is that the policies must be truly inclusive. Because if we are to have a just transition, such plans have to be done in a participatory way, which means we need to provide spaces and long-term plans have to be done working with traditionally excluded groups. In that, in that sense, we, we, we like to say that uh, we have to respect that quote unquote, nothing about us without us. So in, for example, in Costa Rica, when this decarbonization plan and the national determined contributions were set out, they were done through workshops that included women, indigenous population, the elderly, youth, people with disabilities, along the lines of what, what Nicolas was saying, because this is very uh, politically contentious and we have to be able to bring them and bring their voice in order to be able to craft uh, strategies that are, leave no one behind. Then when, if Costa Rica, when Costa Rica launched the decarbonization plan, we also thought, well, how can we continue to mount export diversification, FDI and trade negotiations to be very, very aligned to such plans as a value proposition. So as, as, as the report very, I would say, strategically points out, because we need so many policy levers moving at the same time. For example, in Costa Rica, and I'll just, just use an example of how this played out in our country. When the Ministry of Environment launched the decarbonization plan, at the same time, in that moment, I was working in technical education in the country, well, we launched a curriculum basically for the green skills. That means everything from who's gonna repair and maintain the electric vehicles, who's gonna provide technical support for renewable energy and even farming in, in organic agriculture. So complementing the skill side. With our export promotion agency, we had to launch uh, programs supporting and financing small and medium enterprises, being able to, to transform their businesses to be aligned not only to this, uh, this green agenda, but also um, around green technologies. And on the other end, we had our investment promotion agency launching this initiative that uh, Amir briefly pointed out, which is the biomaterials uh, initiative with the uh, Inter-American Development Bank saying, if we co Costa Rica is already promoting itself as a location for foreign direct investment that values sustainability, how can companies that are here and wanna move to more value added uh, initiatives sort of, such as research and development can do so with the support of the government because I believe that these are the things that have to be incentivized by the government and then let the private sector play its own role. And finally, just one last example from the Ministry of Foreign Trade, we started the negotiation of the ACCTS, which is the Agreement on Climate Change, Trade and Sustainability. This is a plurilateral agreement, a trade negotiation that we've been doing with um, Norway, Switzerland, Fiji, uh, New Zealand. Basically, like-minded countries to promote the exchange of environment, environmental goods and services. And this is very important because this, again, incentivizes the flow of goods around um, the, the transformation from a linear to a circular production uh, and consumption patterns that we need to be able to, to move this forward. Finally, in terms of the challenges ahead, just to be able to wrap up, number one challenge that I see, and Amir correctly pointed out, is the political cooperation in Latin America. As you know, economic and trade integration um, in the region 
has been challenging, will continue to be challenging because I'm going to mention just three, three main things. One is well, lack of infrastructure. So that means there's very high transportation costs, logistics costs around the region. We have weak mechanisms of integration uh, and there's trade barriers basically because of entrenched local interests uh, and the history of our economic integration in Latin America has led to a fragmentation and sub-regional integration efforts, which don't, don't necessarily lead to optimization in terms of what the region can achieve. So political instability and different views on how these issues uh, are played out and how they balance with national interest will be probably the, the biggest challenge ahead. Financing, I agree. Um, I agree, and I think COVID uh, as a pandemic has showcased how, how highly indebted our countries are and how we need the support for multilateral organizations. We have fiscal constraints all across the board in the region. Uh, and that basically leads um, uh, funding very, 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 very small for SMEs or for other very high, high risk or venture capital that, that Amir highlighted. So sorry that I took so long. Uh, there's so much to comment on the report. But again, thank you for a very thought provoking exercise and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that students or any participants may have. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's it's uh, difficult to hear, but uh, I think it's my turn. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I would like to thank uh, the Latin American and the Caribbean Center and Canning House for the invitation. I am very honored to comment uh, on Amir, uh, uh, Amir's report about Latin America trade in the age of uh, climate change. It has been a pleasure to read it. Uh, uh, I am very glad to share uh, this, this, this room uh, uh, with both uh, excellent uh, ministers, and uh, so it's it's a pleasure to be here. First of all, I would like to say that the theme of the report is of absolute importance uh, for the Latin American and the Caribbean region, because as Amir uh, recognizes, this is one of the most impacted regions by the effects of climate climate change. The concern for uh, climate change and even for other basic securities such as energy and food are important concerns uh, right now for the region uh, peoples and governments. These have only increased along uh, with the political crisis between Russia and Ukraine. And the concept of the document is substantial. It flows well and it is well documented in every aspect. I strongly agree with the whole proposal and I think it is an important contribution. Nevertheless, I will give my criteria to enrich uh, the dialogue uh, here. I will divide my comments in two parts, the diagnosis and the policy recommendations part. In the diagnosis part, I agree with the description of the major problems and opportunities faced by lack in the context of uh, climate uh, change and the risk of not changing its path of development. On one hand, the, importance, the important impacts of changes uh, in the frequency and severity of weather extreme episodes are already affected production, exports, tourism, and infrastructure in the region. On the other hand, the shift toward the decarbonized economies, mainly in some developed countries, is shaping new demands and the standards in the international trade that will affect the oil producer countries and will also increase the demand of the so-called critical materials. Finally, the changes in consumption patterns that ask for more sustainability and healthy sources demand the region producers to make important efforts to diminish their ecological and social impacts. It seems to me important to point out that additionally uh, uh, to this uh, context, uh, uh, 
there is a specific historical uh, structural framework where a structural heterogeneity, payment uh, balance constraints and inequality are unsolved synergistic problems that also need to be considered in a green deal. The region has not changed it, 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 its important dependence on natural resources with very low added value and with a huge ecological footprint, which makes it pertinent to consider a mere warning for diversifying the economy. A CLAC defends the need to make a structural change that in this context must promote an environmental sustainable development, but also enhance equality and overcome poverty, which weakens region social cohesion, as uh, Andres pointed out. Besides the problems and impacts, Amir considers in his report opportunities for key sectors in the region facing the challenges of the climate change age. Starting with uh, the mining, mining sector, it is true that critical minerals can play an important role in America, in Latin America, uh, mainly because of global trends such as energy transition and electromobility. And it's also true that there is still uncertainty and risks on technological disruption and that there are environmental concerns in these activities, which are very important issues in a region where uh, social environmental conflicts are increasing. The extent of the uh, benefits, as Amir points out, will depend on the adequate regionalization of supply chains but also the effective and good governance that adequately confront the unwanted impacts. It requires, of course, policies and huge coordination. I would add that it's important to support changes on the specialization pattern based on raw materials and to think first in the regional development path that the region needs in this, in this cl climate change age, and then think about the role of, uh, on that uh, of the mining sector. Amir proposes using critical materials as a lever of development in, in the LAC region and calls for promoting regional change. However, this is a goal that has not been historically achieved by the region. Uh, a new type of governance is, it is needed with state leadership and good alliances with academy uh, uh, and the private sector, as well as an important regional coordination and cooperation are needed. Regarding the energy sector, Amir gives give us uh, 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 much uh, room in his uh, uh, report explaining uh, that sector. He finds that uh, Latin America is the region with the highest renewable energy participation, which makes, his, uh, make, uh, makes him <laughs> very optimistic about the possibilities. I would be cautious about that because of the slow progress and because it is mainly concentrated in hydropower. The other source or energy are uh, actually marginal, uh, still marginal. Practically 75% of the electricity generated comes from hydropower and further progress should be made to accelerate the adoption of renewables and avoid energy and security due to the climate change and due to the climate variability, along with preventing future impacts, uh, uh, such as those of, uh, uh, of uh, Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine's war. There is still a long way to go when it comes to changing the energy matrix. And there are huge challenges 
to overcome not only on the supply side, but also in the demand side. It is important in the today's context to describe current increase in hydrocarbon prices and how this differentially affects our black countries, uh, uh, both oil producers and net importers. One. And high, uh, highlight the opportunity to strengthen the transition towards clean and re uh, renewable energies. ECLAC has estimated energy transition scenarios, uh, investment costs to break down and job generations that could be taken into account. In the field of biodiversity, as Amir recognizes, the LAC region is probably the richest region in natural capital in the world. However, this has not been strategically used by the countries and it's necessary to coordinate multiple policy efforts to leverage the trade value of the biodiversity. Amir affirms what is one of our uh, uh, perhaps greatest uh, wishes for the region when he states that biodiversity-based trade and innovation services can be a transformative force for boosting economic development and trade in the region. In, in LAC, 20% uh, of employment depends heavily on healthy ecosystem services, but these jobs are vulnerable and variable. So we need to change toward sustainable quite urgently. Uh, considering the recommendation part, Amin uh, mentions five, uh, kind, uh, uh, five uh, key uh, findings and recommendations to further support the transition to sustainable and inclusive economies. The first one is referred to the energy transition and its potentialities as driver for developing high value added low carbon industrial and services activities. I very much agree with that. ECLAC has also mentioned uh, the energy transition to sustainable renewable energy and sustainable mo mobility and electromobility as key drivers to develop other industrial capabilities in the region with less footprint. However, in order to do so, regional integration and complementarity should be boosted as the region is moving beyond uh, coordination and cooperation uh, among countries. On the other hand, a better participative and effective governance, as I said, is needed to drive the different stakeholders through the energy transition. The energy transitions will not spontaneously happen. It is important to consider that Latin America and the Caribbean the Caribbean is an uh, heterogeneous region. For example, there are oil producers and exporters versus oil net importers. The latter have a greater incentives to accelerate the energy transitions as, as uh, the Minister of uh, Chile has, has told us the, than the former. Thus, it is important to achieve the will of all the countries understanding the different realities and needs. The second uh, uh, group of, of, of recommendations are referred to biodiversity and ecosystem services as a transformative forms in, in, in the sustainable development of the region. Amir states that the global push toward decarbonization and climate change mitigation will be a driver of change in trade opportunities in our region. It is true that carbon emissions trading systems uh, need go beyond countries and continental boundaries for carbon markets to be leveraged as, as, as trade tools. And uh, the trend also slowly is going in that direction. But we need concrete uh, commitments uh, from the developed countries to do so. The 
current de de debate on biodiversity in the region appeals to common but differentiated responsibilities. And that must be considered if we want to the, the countries uh, of the South uh, to be able to protect the ecosystem services on which the entire planet depends on. The report recommends and gives uh, um, good examples of payments of, uh, for environment, environmental services programs. That is one of the tools in which uh, we at the CLAC see great potential and they have the tendencies to incorporate to incorporate more uh, social aspects. The region is, is, is home to 23% of the world's uh, uh, forest. However, it's one of the regions with the highest rates of deforestation. Between uh, uh, 1,990 and uh, 2,020, like lost 70% of its uh, forest area. Uh, on top of that, indigenous people and local communities are intimately uh, linked to biodiversity in LAC. And there are several studies that show that uh, the best conserved lands are occupied by indigenous peoples and local communities who have an essential role in their, in their culture custody and conservation, but uh, uh, who have not been sufficiently recognized and supported. Another good recommendation and, and um, examples uh, of, uh, are uh, to highlight the transformative role of ecotourism, which uh, usually gives jobs to women and young people in places where sometimes there are uh, not many options. But we know that relying heavily on tourism can become a vulnerability. Uh, tourism services was the sector, for instance, hardest hit, uh, hit uh, by the pandemic, which uh, in pre-pandemic uh, represented 42% of export of goods and services in the Caribbean and 10% in Latin America and generated 6 million direct jobs and 15 million indirect jobs. In regards to the biodiversity-based information, Amir clearly points out that if the region does not invest in research and development, in developing human and technical capacities, in facilitating the administrative path for the collection, and it, if it doesn't provide financial support, it will not be able to consolidate these opportunities because the richness of endemic species and varieties in the region is, 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 is enormous. But we have this uh, huge constraint that uh, government should consider. The green and blue uh, recovery that articulates the short and long term vision is an urgent need to act on the causes and uh, uh, that are behind multiple uh, current crises. However, it must uh, uh, consider that in fact, the world is far behind its intentions uh, of the uh, $14.6 trillion announced in fiscal measures in uh, 2020 by the world's uh, 50 largest economies only 2.5% are for green recovery. And this is more problematic for, for, for the regions. Arge Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru had uh, only uh, $278 billion for uh, green uh, uh, recovery, of which uh, 1.2 billion are consistent with the environmental uh, and climate goals. As Amir has highlighted, the, the, the region has many very important assets for the economy of the future, but no less uh, important challenges in knowing how to use them strategically. 
Uh, the third one dimension is referred to the need for coordinated policies at the national level uh, to foster the development of capabilities needed for low carbon transformation across the region, such as labor market policy, skill development policy, policies, fin financing policies, information sharing, and regional coordination. Those are uh, 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 in fact, uh, very important uh, uh, policies to consider and AMIR um, recommendations are very useful. ECLAC has suggested uh, to articulate industrial, technological, social, and environmental policies that are very relevant to push not only a low carbon transformation, but also an inclusive transformation that uh, pursue equality and strengthen our democracies in this very unequal uh, region. The fourth one is the need for uh, regional coordination and regionalization of supply chains, with which I strongly agree on. Amir makes a taxonomy and identifies good examples of some different specialities in, in the Latin American countries. I think the region would go even beyond that to integration and complementarity in certain chains uh, based on natural resources, for instance, where countries could also share knowledge and technological uh, abilities, infrastructure, fiscal uh, regulations to avoid race to the bottom practices that are uh, a fact in the region in, 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 in difficult times. Finally, Amir makes the advocacy for a central issue for uh, the Latin American and the Caribbean region, which is the need of a Green Deal that could generate considerable positive uh, uh, impacts across a wide array of economic sectors, such as, as uh, clean energy, agriculture, uh, inter and intra uh, trade in electricity and carbon emission trading system, climate smart mining, and bioeconomy of uh, the, uh, the biodiversity. This is a challenge uh, 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 that we have thought for uh, many years. ECAC has proposed a big push for sustainability in some similar sectors and other crucial ones, such as energy transition, public services such as electromobility and water and sanitation, circular economy, agroecological transition, care economy, health industry, uh, sustainable tourism and bioeconomy, and digital uh, inclusion. Amir correctly proposes that to address this Green Deal, regional coordination is necessary. This is a major challenge in a region that has historically had problems uh, uh, to build uh, common regional agendas, but I deeply agree with the need for that. Another important recommendation from Amir is uh, uh, to join several multisectoral transitions for green productive transformation and articulate industrial labor and skill policies I would add the need to also join simultaneously macroeconomic, environmental, and social policies. To get such an important transformation requires an important role of the, of the governments uh, uh, in the region that have important fiscal constraints and need to work with the private, private sector and civil society. That is why the Green Deal is necessary, as Amir has correctly pointed out. Finally, LAC can make the effort, uh, uh, important efforts, but there is not, if there is not a global uh, deal to assure the climate security, the peace and the financial stability, the results would be very constrained for the region as well as, as the war for the war. With this, I would like to conclude uh, 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 with what I said at the beginning of my intervention. The theme, the cons, and the recommendations of Amir's report are pertinent and important. 
and I would like to congratulate uh, Amir for the courage of writing such a difficult and comprehensive report. He has done a very good job and he leaves us in the region important inputs for the debates and proposals to change the development path in Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette, and, and to the other uh, discussants. What I'm going to propose in the interests of a little internal energy transition um, is to open up 20 questions in the room, uh, rather than to invite Amir to respond to the discussants directly. Uh, also for people online, uh, if they want to post some questions, and Maria Clara will communicate those to me and to Amir. But um, in the first instance, if people in the room have some comments or uh, questions to pose uh, for uh, Amir, then I'd very much like to hear them. There's a question in the back corner. Hey. How far do we trust this technology? <laughs> Try with this one. It's perfect. Thank you. It was a very, very interesting presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Uh, um, I wanted to ask Amir uh, about uh, um, innovation coming from biodiversity and what would be um, legal tools, also in terms of intellectual property and also economic policy tools through which uh, countries in Latin America could retain the economic benefits coming from this innovation and also incentivize people who would be interested in investing in this type of innovation to invest but also to apply those conditionalities in order for this investment not to be environmentally destructive and also to uh, create economic benefits for, for, the, for these countries. Thank you. Wonderful. Before I may have jumped in on that. That is, does anybody else have a question, particularly with the microphone in that area of the room? Uh, thank you me for the report and for uh, to all the speakers. Thank you for, for the insights as well. Um, touching on, on, on something that you briefly mentioned at the at the end about uh, the political maybe political constraints. Uh, I these policy challenges uh, imply a lot of coordination uh, between countries. We've heard a little bit about the, the political issues within countries to get uh, these uh, policies approved and, and implemented. But I would like to hear a bit more about, about the institutional challenges. Maybe are there um, political spaces uh, lacking for, for these coordinations to take place? Um, are there any um, challenges facing these cross-border um, problems? And I would like to do a bit more about that. Thank you. Thank you. And we have to cut in on those two questions or and also any other comments from the discussants that you want to uh, pick up? Yeah, sure. Can I want yeah, can they hear me online? Yeah, super. Uh, first of all, thanks very much for this really really interesting comments um i wish i could kind of rewrite the report with all this kind of feedback in stock but uh but this is extremely helpful thinking about those uh, those issues uh, especially kind of from the practitioner point of view right in terms of the political realities that you need to to deal with it, especially the, the social dimension of things um i will the first question from Giovanni uh, over there on bioinnovation and the kind of uh, institutional issues, intellectual property problems and policy tools. This is a very tough question um, because some of it, I mean, it's a very gray area legally. The first aspect of biodiversity based innovation is, you know, the extraction of genetic material, right, which you then use for innovation, which is already happening for the pharmaceutical se sector, for agriculture, for cosmetics and so on. And there are a lot of regulation that concerns transport and genetic material, property right, it still is not always respected. So this is governed by the Nagoya Protocol. The US has not ratified the agreement, for example. Very often, for example, in Costa Rica, I met researchers complaining like people would come and take genetic material out of the country in their suitcases and so on. And that's why Costa Rica's efforts were interesting on that front because they tried to promote this industry locally and actually 
Chanel has a, has, has a product, right? Uh, and they're has, using kind of a, a molecule found in Costa Rica. And they use, I don't know for which purpose it's used, but you can probably find it in London. But the other issue is inspiration, right? And there's nothing that governs inspiration. You find something. And by the way, this is kind of the natural process of R&D, right? I mean, in evolution. So it's normal to get inspiration from almost everything, from solar cells actually based on leaves. Wind turbines mimic the fins of whales and many other things like this. And this is very hard to track down. And it's already happening, right? It's, it's uh, hundreds of billions of, of dollars of, of industry around the R&D of biomimetics. But it's very hard to prove, right, that you get inspiration from somewhere. And this is why governments can take kind of itself being, and by virus cases, by the way, in Latin America, considerable every year is there are biopiracy cases in firms in East Asia, Europe, and the US. This is why governments in Latin America could take a step right ahead of, 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 of the curve and try to develop develop technologies locally, right, and support it in, in this way. About political challenges, I mentioned a few. I think the uh, our, our speakers also mentioned a few of them. And by the way, this is probably the few challenges that we know of, and there are probably many more that we don't even realize which kind of comes back to the to Hirschman's point. There are probably will be challenges related to the structural constraints that Janet, uh, Andres, and Nicola mentioned. Some countries, they start from different starting points, which means probably some countries will benefit a lot more from this kind of coordination than others. So it's about the coordination of who supplies what, where who gets the investments, kind of that balance between the natural coordination and natural competitive advantage versus uh, social interests, because it will be very difficult to balance. And not only, you know, Nicolas mentioned the kind of social dimension and, and, and divergences at the local level, but at the regional level, I mean, this is another pair of, of, of difficulties. Uh, but we can stay optimistic because there has been agreements, right, uh, taking place. The SCASA one, the, the, the energy partnerships across the region, and perhaps, you know, kind of building on these efforts and obviously the role of ECLAC. Which is very active at right, promoting regional co uh, cooperation since the 1960s. So, yeah. And then, um, do we have any other questions? We've got, we've got questions from okay. some well, users so online, so I'm going to direct them directly to you. Um, this question comes from Amanda Stelitano from Brazil. Uh, she asked you, how do you see the advance of interest in combining? technology and fintech with the sustainable agenda and do you think that using the new tech as blockchain and big data could improve the green and clean energy opportunities in latin america um well the second one comes from bruno perez he's asking what the strategic sector sectors do you think that have more potential to contribute to green economic development in the region and are in the cases cited marginal sectors? And also another question from him. Um, what role do you see in lithium reserves, possibilities of creating maybe an OPEC of lithium and opportunities to upgrade in these value chain manufacturing batteries and EVs? There's Clara, can we also pass the microphone? Sure. Well, the technology is with us. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Amir, for, for the presentation. Uh, I got a question. I mean, I'm not sure if there will be a follow up report on this. It's just because uh, I think there is something that you, you touch upon, and I think uh, probably Andres and uh, Nicolas mentioned as well, which is the social dimension, social challenge. Um, I mean, I, I'm a basically an employment lawyer, so I don't understand much about policy, but I do understand a bit about industrial relations. So, what, having done a bit of research on just transition, one of the issues that faces not just Latin America, but Latin America in particular, is the fact that there will be a lot of resistance from social partners. Um, this is one, one issue. And I think I think we will last mention that. Uh, and the second one is, I think, an element that probably has been a bit, I'm sure it has been overlooked, is the word, but it's the fact that Latin America has a huge percentage of the workforce in the informal economy. So when we talked about and education, when we talked about jobs, when we talked about skills, particularly, I mean, we can, I mean, Argentina or any country can produce any product, but how do you ensure that that big chunk of the workforce is also included there? Um, and I think whatever, like, you know, like Green Deal, we try to develop together, 
uh, I need to take into account that. And just one final point is having done also a bit of research on Latin American integration, I'm a bit less optimistic when it comes to having a Latin American Green Deal. I think it's, we probably need to focus on some certain like sub regional like trade agreements rather than, or sorry, agreements rather than a big global like a Latin American agreement. We have been trying to do that for 300 years and it hasn't been that successful that far. Thank you. I would like to make a last observation before you, you answer two questions. There have been some questions online that have been answered by ministers. So this is for our physical audience. You can see them right now on the screen. So they have been answered already. So you, you can proceed with the rest of the questions. Oh, well, great. For, thank you for taking up online questions to keep the kind of <laughs> dual dynamic uh, debate. Uh, I think we're setting kind of some precedents for hybrid formats. Um, the first question about fintech and startups. Um, well, it's a very important question. Um, you kind of, and there has been interesting initiatives at the, I think who was, it was, it was online, it was Amanda. Uh, interesting initiatives, and actually, one thing that is an issue that is worth mentioning is Startup Chile, right? This program to foster or bring together uh, startups in, in Chile and, and foster kind of an innovation ecosystems. But actually, few of the firms that few of the startups that are involved in this program deal with with uh, low carbon uh, technologies. Um, I have a few examples in the report that I can remember by by. Um, by memory, but things that kind of they offer off grid solar PV, yeah, payment applications, so kind of bringing together the world of fintech and the world of, of clean energy, uh, others that operate in terms of conversion efficiency for customers. So these are the kind of things that need to be scaled up considerably, right? Um, there is uh, the startup and kind of fintech scene in Latin America is a, is a, is a fast growing one. Um, and probably a lot more efforts need to be need to be done to, to encourage it. The question about the OPEC of lithium, uh, personally, I'm, when it comes to lithium, uh, because of the uh, nitrate events that happened in Chile, I'm also a little bit skeptical. I mean, clearly, regional coordination is needed, right, between Argentina, uh, Chile, and, and, and Bolivia. But first of all, whether extraction is worth it is a different question. In Bolivia, there's a lot of social issues and environmental issues. You need to destroy a lot of this the salt lakes to extract lithium. And this is basically a place of natural beauty, bringing tourism. Uh, also the water that you would need, you know, is needed for crops. So it's a kind of a huge opportunity cost. Um, but there's definitely need to have a, a discussion amongst these countries, thinking together about what possible challenges and, and not putting all your eggs in the lithium basket because if hydrogen-based batteries become the norm, uh, it's going to be very tricky to justify having spent all you know, large amounts of, of taxpayers' money and not having done something else. About the social challenges, it's an extremely important aspect. Um, I think this is one that relates to also the kind of inequality and, and diversification prospects, which actually was the theme of the first report, uh, with so some glitches there. Uh, and it's kind of orienting, and this is where industrial policy comes in, right? Because it's also about rebalancing regional growth, ensuring marginalized communities can be part, so kind of targeting efforts towards particular areas, not just economic areas, but also people. Um, and ensuring that kind of marginalized groups, uh, people that are in the informal sector, also acquire the skills that will be needed is, is quite important, right? And that's something that I think Costa Rica has been sometimes struggling with. I mean, it's, it's a success of export sophistication, but not everybody had had access to the formal job opportunities that arose in, in that process. The resistance from, from partners, that's also an important issue in, in Mexico. There's a big problem in terms of social acceptance of wind turbines. Uh, and that comes into not only dialogue in terms of finding you know, negotiating areas, but also potentially uh, it's also a, a, a kind of education aspect in communication, right? In terms of who benefits if it's, you know, you just have the wind turbine in your backyard, but you actually for themselves. So I think going forward, there'll be, there'll, there'll be need for more discussion, inclusive discussion, and that links to the Green Deal, which shouldn't be just about governments and private sector negotiating this, but involving a lot more uh, communities, civil society, trade unions, uh, kind of negotiating together uh, the kind of transformation that people you know, see a, a benefit in. And the part on, on 
pessimism, optimism. It's a, it's a right one, but um, maybe as uh, I finished the presentation with a quote, maybe it's suitable to add another one. As Gramsci said, you need to have uh, pessimism of the intellect, but optimism of the will. So there are clear challenges going forward, but you know the status quo is taking basically you know a straight to a wall. So maybe it's time to take some uh, leap of faith. Okay, we're going to trade and some aphorisms here. <laughs> Pessimist is an informed optimist or something. I don't know. Um, thank you, Amir. Um, I'm very conscious of our remaining 90 seconds or so. I am slightly struck by some of your responses and, and some of the comments also from uh, on, online. What is the net growth of an event we did, I want to say about two years ago, with uh, Chief Economist of IDB and so forth? You were involved in that, I think, as well. About long term infrastructure-led development, inclusive-led development, et cetera, et cetera, and the question then posed, which he didn't answer, uh, which was about in, an, in a continent which is largely driven by slow growth, but where the political impetus clearly is requiring fast growth, under what circumstances can you price in things like green energy transitions, which are going to be slow growth longer term, uh, issues, as you mentioned, about venture capital and so forth. There is an inherent sort of political cycle there that really is going to be, and the trade agreement element, I, I think, in part. I will leave that rather than inviting you to answer it. Perhaps you can grab me or mug me uh, in the foyer afterwards. So um, it just serves to me to say, um, you know, if Christina wants to come in as well, just to provide a quick closer. But uh, thank you to everybody in the room. Thank you to everybody online, in particular our three discussants. And I hope very much we can uh, remain in contact with you uh, in person and or virtually uh, in, in the future. Uh, there were some fantastic uh, interjections from you. And uh, for the, please read the report in whichever language uh, you feel most comfortable. Um, I think there will be some a blog uh, and some other outputs as well to uh, accompany the uh, the report in, in time. Uh, and if you haven't heard enough uh, live, then there will be a clean edited version of the podcast in which there will appear to be no uh, technical <laughs> issues whatsoever. Uh, we will completely TED talk it and, uh, uh, and the world will be wonderful as a result. So uh, thank you very much, Christina. Uh, no, I mean, really uh, just wanted to say thank you also to, to Amir for, for his second report. Um, and I have to say both the reports have been fascinating for us at Canning House. What we are trying to do, as I said earlier, is really cover a lot of the aspects of things that are relevant for policymakers so they can actually start doing some of the things that effectively the reports are recommending. It's deliberately broad that, that we're casting this. You know, we're not deep slicing um, into specific areas so much as trying to connect across a lot of ranges, which immediately makes a lot of questions in each of the individual practicalities how you can do this, but how you can do that, but how you can do the other. Um, what I would say is watch this space. We, sadly, we're, lo we're losing Amir. Uh, from the program, but uh, we have other topics that are going to follow on behind, uh, which will not be entirely dissimilar. They're, it's all connected ultimately. And uh, we're really excited by the program and uh, delighted with the reports to date. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Please network, grab each other. Uh,